Hi, my name is Shelby, and this is Merrily Morbid, the channel that covers everything from deadly diseases to true crime, natural disasters to man-made disasters, deadly religions and cults, and anything else, well, morbid. So if that's interesting to you, hit the subscribe button and stay tuned. Death is something that we will all face. Not a single one of us will be able to slip its grasp. But perhaps by confronting it head on, we can become a little bit more comfortable with it. Today we will look at several things that you can do with your body after you take your final breath. So sit back and let's get morbid. The first thing I wanna talk about is organ donation. 17 people die each and every day waiting on an organ transplant that unfortunately never came. First and foremost, everything possible is done to save the person. Some people are scared that if doctors or EMTs know that they're organ donors, that they won't try as hard to save that person. This is an absolute myth. EMTs, paramedics, and emergency room doctors are in the business of saving lives that includes people who have chosen to be organ donors after their deaths. These people are brought to the ICU where their life-saving efforts continue and tests begin to determine how much damage has been done. The most common causes for death of those whose organs are viable for transplant are stroke, heart attack, and severe head injury. If a person has been diagnosed as brain dead, then and only then will the organ donation procedures begin. The person will continue to be kept on life support as evaluation begins. People from the Organ Procurement Organization, or OPO, with specialized training will arrive at the hospital to determine if the person is able to donate organs. After the family has been informed of the patient's brain death, a person from the OPO will talk with the family. If the person prior to their death signed up with a state or national agency to be an organ donor, then the family will be informed of the person's wishes, and they will explain the process and answer any questions. It's important to know that just having the organ donor option checked on your driver's license is not enough legally to ensure that you are an organ donor after your death. Even if your driver's license says you want to be an organ donor, your family could go against it. Being officially registered ensures that your wishes are followed. If the person has not signed up for the donor registry, then the option can be presented to the person's family. They will be given time to ask questions and make decisions. Once it has been decided that the person will be an organ donor, their information is entered into UNOS's national database, where they identify possible matches. UNOS stands for United Network for Organ Sharing. At that point, the person is brought into the operating room where their organs are harvested and then sent to hospitals where possible recipients are waiting. At that point, the person is brought to a funeral home. If the person or the family wishes, it is possible to have an open casket funeral. Then, usually a few weeks later, the family will receive a letter from the OPO that will inform the family of which organs have been donated. If both parties inform the organization that they want to know where the organs came from or went to, they can set up communication between the donor's family and the recipient and their family. The organs, tissues that may be donated could include heart, kidneys, lungs, pancreas, liver, intestines, corneas, skin, tendons, bones, nerves, and heart valves. Cremation is quickly becoming the most popular thing to do with your body after death, and it is posed to overtake burial in the United States. But what exactly is cremation? After the person dies, a local funeral director will be contacted to make the arrangements. Once cremation is chosen, the process begins, usually by members of the family. Once identified, a metal identification tag is left with the body. Then, the legal paperwork is filled out. 
This gives the crematory legal permission to handle the body. The paperwork also deals with specific details of cremation, for example, what container the ashes will be put in afterwards, or who will be responsible for picking up the ashes. Then the body begins to be prepared for cremation. The body is cleaned and they are dressed. Usually the body is not embalmed. Then any jewelry not requested to be left with the body is removed and given to the family. Any mechanical or battery-operated prosthetics are then removed along with any medical devices such as pacemakers. Then the body is put into a cremation box made from cardboard. At this point, the body is ready for cremation. The box with the person's remains is slid into the cremation chamber, also called retort, where it is incinerated at a temperature that can reach up to 1800 degrees Fahrenheit. Once the body has been reduced completely to ashes, which takes about two to three hours, it is left to cool. Then, once the ashes can be handled, the ashes are inspected for anything metal that was not incinerated. That could mean metal pins, screws, rods, metal replacement joints that the person had surgically implanted during their life. Then, the metal is usually sent away to be recycled. The rest of the ashes are then refined even further by a grinder into the finer ashes that we are familiar with. Without this step, there can be bone fragments left in them. Then, at this point, the remains are put into a container, usually an urn or a plastic bag, and then returned to the family. And usually at this point, a memorial service will take place with the ashes present. There are many different things that can be done with the ashes, but we'll get to those soon enough. From the time that the body is handed over to the crematory to when the family receives the ashes is usually between seven to 10 days. It should also be known that there is another type of cremation called liquid cremation, also known as aquamation or alkaline hydrolysis. The body is essentially dissolved in a mixture of very hot water and potassium hydroxide when pressure is applied. The bones left behind are then ground up and returned to the family. People might be interested in aquamation because it's better for the environment. It uses less energy during the process and has no mercury or carbon dioxide released into the air. Next, we move on to the most traditional way that Americans handle bodies, burial. After the person dies, a local funeral director will be contacted to make arrangements, which can include the choice of a casket, choosing a cemetery plot, and scheduling transportation. In preparation for burial, a body is prepared. Often people choose embalming, though it isn't usually needed. The benefit is that the body decomposes at a slower rate, but it really only delays the inevitable. If a person decides on embalming, they will go through a process. First, the clothes are removed from the body. Rings will be fastened or taped in place, and glasses and other jewelry are removed. Then, the mouth is closed. This can be done with a rolled up towel under the chin, a device with tacks that when twisted hold the mouth shut, or it can be held shut with sutures, otherwise known as stitches. The outside of the body is sanitized, and then the body is placed into the preferred position of legs straight with arms down at the sides. At this point, embalming happens. The blood in the body is removed and then replaced with liquid formaldehyde through the use of a pump. Then any fluid in the abdomen is removed via suction and formaldehyde is pushed back into the abdomen. Following that, the body is bathed. The nails are cleaned, the hair washed, and then the hair is done. Hair on the face is shaved. Then the body is dressed in the clothes that the family provides to the funeral home. Makeup is applied to make the person look as close to how they did when they were alive. Finally, the body is placed into the casket. Let's talk about caskets. They generally come in wood or metal, with wood being preferred for aesthetics, while metal is preferred for its durability. Then there are the details, from the fabric lining of the casket to the finish on the outside, painted or polished. You can have a straightforward, simple box, or you can have an ornately carved casket. Then there's the handles and the hardware. Caskets are highly customizable. Then, after the services or funerals, the casket will be transported to the cemetery in a previously chosen plot, 
There may be a graveside service, and often the family will throw the first handfuls of dirt onto the casket. The casket can be lowered with the family present or after they've left. It's up to the family to decide their preference. The grave at the time has a temporary marker that will be replaced by a headstone eventually. Which depends on the cemetery's rules. This can be anywhere from six weeks to one year. But depends on the soil in the cemetery and its ability to hold the headstone. It should be noted that you can have a green burial if you prefer. Although, regulations regarding it depend on the state that you live in, or rather, the one that you die in. But essentially, a green burial is one that involves a body that hasn't been embalmed and can be placed in a biodegradable container, or in a shroud, or without anything at all. The appeal here is that it is environmentally friendly and adheres to the natural eco-cycle. Fancy for the circle of life. Moving on, some people want good to come out of their deaths, and a good way to do that is by donating your body to science, which is also known as whole body donation. Before anything, you must figure out which program you're interested in donating your body to, and seeing if you would fit the criteria that they're looking for. The program you choose will also depend on where you live. In some states, there are anatomical boards. In other states, you have to reach out to specific programs that you're interested in. You must complete a registration or authorization form with your chosen program while you're still living. If you live in a state that has an anatomical board, that form will be the same for the entire state. The forms may include information about the time frame regarding the donation, the sharing of any test results, the release of medical records, and other disclosure topics. The forms can also have explanations about how the body will be used in research or education, where it will be sent, or if a transfer of the body is possible, how the body will be handled, such as being disarticulated or embalmed, etc. The forms will discuss the age and the competency of the person wanting to donate their body. And finally, the forms will discuss what the institution will do with the remains when the processes have been completed, such as cremation, burial, etc. Most of the time, there are no fees associated with whole body donation. However, Usually, each institution has a mile radius, say 50 miles, where they will pay for transportation of the body within 50 miles, but outside 50 miles, the estate would be responsible for paying for the transportation. You should also know that there are reasons that a donation may be refused. One reason is that the person's organs have already been donated, although some institutions will still accept those bodies. Another reason could be an infectious disease, like HIV AIDS, hepatitis, or a prion disease. If you aren't familiar with prion diseases, I would like to recommend my first video, which goes into depth about the various 100% fatal prion diseases. Other reasons for refusal could include the body is extremely underweight, or the body is extremely overweight, the body has been autopsied or embalmed, it is after the donation time period, usually limited to a few days. They don't need any more bodies at the time, or the family doesn't want the donation to go through. It's recommended that you inform your family of your wishes to ensure that they follow through with them. If you don't, and the family doesn't give their permission, the donation will be stopped. Going back to the time limit thing, places will have time limits on when they can accept bodies for donation, a few days. That means from the time of death to when the body is delivered to the institution accepting the donation will only be about 72 hours or less. What that means is that a regular funeral with the body present is not possible and leaves only room for memorial services. This may be difficult for the family as funerals can help the family process the death. So why donate your body at all? There are many ways a donated body can help out society. Bodies can be used for teaching anatomy or teaching medical students how to perform different kinds of surgeries, testing out new surgical techniques and technologies, and even help with the study of diseases like dementia. The biggest reason is just to help people. One story I read was about a 93-year-old woman who wanted to donate her organs, but since she was so old, she was ineligible for it. But then her family found the perfect alternative whole body donation, which doesn't have age limits. 
The procedure is a lot like that of organ donation. You have to get the family's consent, have medical professionals look over the body to determine if it's acceptable for donation, and then a representative from the chosen institution will come and get the body. The body at that point may be embalmed for preservation. If the body is going to be used for medical school dissection and is being embalmed, the process will take months, but ensures that the body will stay preserved to last for the entire academic year. Another science field that you could donate your body to would be forensic anthropology. There are things called body farms, which essentially are places where we learn about the decomposition of bodies in a very scientific, controlled way. The bodies are left out in the environment to decompose naturally. There are several in the United States, and each adds invaluable information to the field, especially as the environment changes so much from region to region. Texas has dry heat. Florida has humidity and high heat. Illinois has a more temperate climate and has winters. The body farms allow for students to excavate remains, examine teeth and bones, see the rate at which a body decomposes in nature in that region, observe insect activity, measure the body's interactions with the soil immediately around it, create biological profiles, analyze trauma, and learn how to document their findings. Essentially, body farms are simulations of crime scenes, and they can teach us so much and help solve crimes and identify bodies that might otherwise go unidentified. Maybe decomposing out in a field isn't your ideal ever after. Perhaps this is more your speed. One of the flashiest things you can do with your body is probably have your ashes turned into a cremation diamond. You essentially pick the color, the cut, and the carrot that you want the diamond to be. You can decide if you want the diamond by itself or if you want it placed in jewelry. As you can expect, this is where a lot of the cost comes from. Once you have designed it to your wishes, you send the chosen company some of your ashes, then they will make the diamond through the use of high heat and pressure over a few months. It's very straightforward. However, there are some things to keep in mind. There can be legal trouble. Families have had disputes over who gets possession of the jewelry made from the ashes of their loved ones, whereas cremation remains can be split up to be given to various family members. A single piece of jewelry doesn't allow for this and could lead to some very messy fights. Then there are the legal and moral implications regarding the classification of diamond as property versus a human body. There is an obligation to deal with the body and put it to rest in a respectful way. What if the person would have been offended at being a piece of jewelry to be possessed? Then, what if that piece of jewelry gets lost or isn't handed down? Where does it end up eventually? Say a person's remains are made into a ring, and a few generations down the line, the story becomes lost to time. That ring that literally contains human remains could sit at the bottom of a jewelry box until one day it's sold at a pawn shop. I'm not saying that that's happened. I'm just saying being a piece of jewelry would not be my first choice. Now this is probably the most environmentally friendly thing you could do with your body although right now it's only legal in a handful of states. First, as always, you have to die. Then, the body is given over to the chosen company. The body is laid in a vessel, and then wood chips, alfalfa, and straw are laid in around the body, in proportion specific to the body. Then, the vessel is closed up, and over the next five to seven weeks, the process takes place. The composting process may include the adding of bacteria, fungi, and protozoa to the vessel in order to speed up the process and have as much of the body composted as possible. The vessel is carefully monitored with probes to make sure that the conditions inside are stable and ideal for the process. A drop in temperature will require oxygen to be added to the vessel, usually by mixing up the organic material inside the vessel. When the body has finished the process, the soil is looked through for anything inorganic, which could include joint replacements, rods, stents, pacemakers. The bones are then ground down into a fine powder since they don't break down fast enough through the composting process. 
Then the new soil is kept at a high temperature of 131 degrees Fahrenheit to kill any bacteria and cure. The final compost will be tested to make sure that the newly made soil is safe and doesn't contain any harmful bacteria or toxic heavy metals. Then once deemed safe, it is ready to be used. Each body is converted to about one cubic yard of soil. That's around 500 pounds, but depending on the size of the body, you could get over to 1,000 pounds. You can donate the soil to an environmental conservation project, or your family can use it to grow plants and trees. Some of the compost companies offer to use the compost in the planting of new trees in a graveyard made of trees. I am most interested in human composting for myself after death. Such a beautiful thing in my opinion. You get to live on in a way. A tree grown with my remains can grow beautiful and tall and be home to little creatures and birds. I just like the idea of living on through others after I'm gone. For those who are interested in environmental aspects of it, it doesn't use fossil fuels like cremation. And for each person that chooses this method, saves up to one and a half metric tons of carbon dioxide from being produced. Instead of being added to the air, the carbon is returned to the earth as nourishment. How about space burial, also known as a memorial space flight? First, the body is cremated like any other type of cremation. Quickly, let's talk about the cost. There is a huge range from 2,500 to 12,500. It mostly depends on how far into space you want your ashes to go. Bringing the ashes just outside the atmosphere may only run you a couple thousand, but if you want the ashes to go as far as the moon or farther, it'll cost you more than 10 grand. So anyway, the company that you are working with will send you a tube that is about the size of a tube of lipstick. For additional fees, you may be able to customize the tube with the person's name, birth, and death dates. You may even be able to add a special message. You will place some of the person's remains into the tube and send it back to the company. Since the ashes are brought aboard by commercial spacecraft companies like SpaceX, you may have to wait for a mission to happen to be able to proceed with a space burial. Some companies will invite the family to watch the launch of the spacecraft carrying their loved one's ashes, but often there's a live feed of the flight for those who can't make it. Since some missions last for days to weeks, you may be able to track the flight carrying the ashes so you always know where they are. Then, at the end of the flight, the ashes are brought back down to Earth and then returned to the family, who will then proceed with more traditional rites of burial, whether it's burial or cremation or what have you. Contrary to popular belief, the ashes aren't released and spread into space. Spacecraft are surprisingly delicate and can be damaged by the smallest debris, even ashes could be catastrophic. And finally, we arrive at cryonics. This is by far the strangest thing on the list, in my opinion, just because the outcome is not very likely to be successful. Now, first order of business is to explain that it's called cryonics and not cryogenics. I was definitely guilty of confusing the two. So cryogenics is the science related to temperatures below freezing. Cryonics is the freezing of a person who has died in hopes that the person can be revived at some point in the future. So how does it work? First, as always, the person dies. But for those who have already decided on cryopreservation, their body is packed in ice and sent to whichever cryonics institution that they've chosen. There, the blood is drained from the body and replaced with something called cryoprotective agents. They include antifreeze and organ-preserving compounds. Following that, the body is put inside of a chamber that is filled with liquid nitrogen, which is kept at negative 196 degrees Celsius or negative 320.8 degrees Fahrenheit. Then the body remains there indefinitely. The process is incredibly expensive, which leads to some people choosing to have only their head frozen, which is called neuropreservation. The thought with that is that since our brains are essentially computers, 
Someday, we would be able to download our personalities, thoughts, experiences, and what makes us us into new bodies grown in labs or robotic bodies. So remember how I said that bodies remain in cryopreservation indefinitely? Can you guess when the first body was put into cryopreservation? Believe it or not, considering how futuristic it seems, the first person was a man who died from liver cancer in 1967. That's 57 years ago. You know what else is kind of wild? Around 500 people have already undergone the process, and some of them have even chosen to have their pets frozen as well. The most famous person so far to have chosen cryonics is Ted Williams, the baseball player for the Red Sox. And two other people that have expressed interest in cryonics for the future are Paris Hilton and Seth MacFarlane. The real drawback is that it's all theoretical, and there isn't a lot of evidence to show that it will ever be possible to live a second life through the process of cryonics. And that's it for today. If you enjoyed today's video, please hit the like button. If you've gotten this far and you're not already a subscriber, please subscribe. I cover all sorts of morbid topics, and my current goal is just to hit 100 subscribers. Comment down below which thing you would like to do with your body. Team composting for me. Thanks for watching. Be merry, but stay morbid.